BSD is still dying. Uh, welcome to BSD is still dying. It's not quite dead yet, but we're getting there. And uh, well, welcome to the closing of BC BSD Con 2009. So what is BSD? Well, BSD is a derivative of Unix. Okay, so what is Unix? Unix is an operating system. Uh, what's an operating system? An operating system is the soul of a computer. But, but what's a computer? A computer is a tool, uh, it's basically a glorified calculator, that enables users to accomplish tasks better. So what is a user? A user is someone who operates the computer. They tend to stand upright, sort of like me, Tiny Bob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so who am I? Uh, my name is Jason Dixon. First and foremost, I'm a sysadmin. I like to work on networks and firewalls. I like to tweak. No. Yes. <laughs> I'm a programmer, sort of. I enjoy programming with Perl, Postgres, and Apache Web Servers. I'm a consultant here. I'm an employee. Damn. Oh, not there. <laughs> Missed that slide. Sorry, I actually work for Rava. Or, I'm sorry, OmniTI. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I switch jobs entirely too often. <laughs> and I'm a lover of BSD. Okay, but why am I here? To talk about why BSD is dying. Sex and greed. <laughs> it really has nothing to do with either of these. <laughs> but if I told you licensing of blobs, would you have showed up? Not that you had a choice. To quickly summarize, what is BSD? What is Unix? What is an operating system? What is a computer? A computer. A computer is a device that computes, especially a programmable electronic machine that performs high-speed mathematical or logical operations, or that assembles, stores, correlates, or otherwise processes information. This is a computer. This is a small computer. This is a big computer. This is a big fake computer. <laughs> and this is a really old computer. <laughs> but what does a computer really do? It helps us write documents. For example, Linux man pages. <laughs> we can compose shopping lists. Computers can even de uh, delete documents on the fly. <laughs> we can write emails, surf the web, watch movies, uh, <laughs> movies, listen to our favorite music, and even play games. <laughs> but how does the computer let us do these things? It starts by taking text known as the source code and using a compiler we can translate it into binary ma machine language. That's the foundation for the kernel, libraries, and user land applications, otherwise known as an operating system, like BSD. So you ask, what is a kernel? It's a wonderful thing that allows for the management of processes, memory, and peripheral devices. <laughs> and by extension, allows us to do cool stuff like networking, provide better security, work with disks and file systems, create user interfaces, and interact with user-led applications that let us do things like write documents, read email, surf the web, watch movies, listen to music, play games, and much, much more. In summary, BSD is a Unix-derived operating system. It enables users to harness the power of a computer to process information better. It uses a kernel to manage processes, memories, and memory and peripheral devices, and by extension, we can perform networking and force security, read from, write to, storage devices, <laughs> interface visually to applications like text editors, mail editors, mail clients, web browsers, multimedia players, and games. <laughs> <laughs> for a second, I'd like to look back over the history of Unix for a few minutes. Now, <laughs> to be honest, um, Kirk McCusick just trumped everything I have in my talk. So, um, but a lot of it's going to be a repeat, but it's, it's still pretty good. Um, so in the beginning, and yes, there was life before Unix, we had the Holy Trinity. MIT, Bell Labs, and GE teamed to create a system called Multix the Multiplexed Information and Computing Service. And we have a huge GE650 mainframe running Multics. Um, you can tell the engineers from the pointy hair bosses. <laughs> Somewhere in there. And so it was a huge success. 
We all run Multics on our laptop mainframes, of course. Actually, no, it was a commercial failure. Fortunately, there was a computer scientist at Bell Labs named Ken Thompson. He'd worked on the Multics project and was inspired by the interactive computing it provided. Unfortunately, the scrapping of the Multics project meant that he no longer had a system with which to perform serious work like space travel, a space simulation game that he had written for Multics on the GE 650 mainframe. With Dennis Ritchie's assistance and his experience from the Multics project, they were able to craft together an operating system of assembly language running on a PDP-7. It was capable of interacting commu interactive computing with a terminal rather than just feeding a punch, card, uh, punch key cards. They termed it the Unix systems. Unix systems, short for Uniplexed Information and Computing System, a play on the, on the Multics name. It supported a number of users. I missed something. The number of users. for a number of users. <laughs> Talk about your anticlimactic slides. <laughs> By 1970, it officially became known as UNIX, probably to save a bite of memory. <laughs> they would have made really good OpenBSD programmers back then. By 1971, the Unix system was officially put into production use. It had been ported to the PDP-11. It was capable of text processing for the purpose of filing patents. <laughs> I was trying to visualize software patents, and a, a cat kicking a dog is probably the closest thing to it in real life. <laughs> By 1973, they rewrote Unix. In a portable language created by Dennis Ritchie, the C programming language evolved from the B language, adding data, data types and structures. But thanks to a 1958 antitrust case, AT&T had been for forbidden to enter the computer business. This meant Unix could not be turned into a product, so they would ship tapes and disk packs of the source code to anyone who asked. Since the source code was freely available and written in a portable computer language, universities and research labs worldwide were able to run Unix on their own systems. By 1974, Professor Bob Favre at the University of Cal Berkeley purchased a copy of Unix for $99 for their own PDP-11. By 1977, Bill Joy, a graduate student at Cal Berkeley, distributed the Berkeley Software Distribution, <coughs> otherwise known as 1BSD. It included a Pascal compiler, the EX editor, and the EX editor. By 1978, 2BSD had been released, which added the VI editor and a C shell. I'm definitely not old school when it comes to editors. Uh, Cornshaw for the win. 1979, 3BSD was released, adding support for the VAX platform. It was coined as Virtual VAX or VM Unix, thanks to the new virtual memory implementation written specifically for the VAX Unix 32V computer at Berkeley. Thanks to the success of 3BSD, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, awarded Berkeley CSRG with a contract to enhance Unix for the VLSI project. These enhancements were eventually released as 4BSD, which added job control for the seashell, deliver mail, the predecessor to send, uh, to send mail, the curses programming library, and reliable signals. Unfortunately, BSD, 4BSD was criticized for bad performance on the VAX platform. So Bill Joe went back to work tuning the kernel to outperform VMS on the VAX eventually releasing 4.1 BSD for these performance fixes. Two years later, 4.2 was released, incorporating a TCPI stack from BBN Technologies, also a contractor for DARPA, as well as the Berkeley Fast File System, written by a dapper young man by the name of Kirk McCusick, who was also kind enough to give us the original Beastie mascot. In 1986, 4.3 BSD was unleashed, incorporating numerous performance improvements, including a non-BBN version of the TCPIP stack, which was found to be superior by DARPA. 1988, the next version of BSD was released. 4.3 BSD Tahoe, so named for the short-lived Power 632 Tahoe platform. This was an initial attempt at moving away from the, back, the VAX platform. Although Tahoe was unsuccessful, it helped introduce machine-independent code that would, improve, that would improve BSD's future portability. <laughs> 
Up to this point, all versions of BSD included proprietary AT&T code and required licenses from AT&T for their use. These licenses had become prohibitively expensive, driving demand for an AT&T-free version of Unix. This led to the release of Net1, a BSD licensed distribution of the free BSD, the free BSD networking code, unencumbered by any AT&T code or licenses. The next year, 4.3 BSD Reno was released, uh, the naming suggesting a gamble when used in production use. <laughs> Regardless, it included the mock virtual memory system, some compatible NFS, and continued the movement towards POSIX compliance. It became apparent that the AT&T code was a hassle, so Keith Bostick at the CSRG ruled all, virtually all the utilities and code that was still from AT&T. In the middle of 1991, Net2 was released, a nearly complete BSD Unix system that was freely distributable under the BSD license. Net2 was the basis for two separate ports of BSD to the Intel 8036, 8386 architecture. Bill Jolitz started the 386 BSD uh, distribution, a short-lived but became the basis for the FreeBSD and NetBSD projects. Berkeley Software Design BSDI came out with BSD386, a proprietary version later renamed as BSDOS. In 1992, a wholly owned subsidiary of AT&T, Unix System Laboratories, also, named as, also known as USL, filed suit against BSDI, claiming that AT&T's proprietary code was included in the, BSDI, the BSD Unix product. An injunction was filed asking for BSDI to discontinue their use of advertising, which alluded to the Unix name, owned by AT&T, and supposedly aimed to confuse unsuspecting users or buyers. Regardless of the fact that BSDOS sold for $995, a 99% discount over AT&T System V Unix, which re retailed for $100,000 to $200,000. You can see where the average consumer might get confused. <laughs> After an extensive analysis, it was uh, determined that BSDOS was little more than Net2, peppered with six files from Bill Jolitz's 386 BSD. The judge presiding over the case denied the injunction, forcing USL to narrow their complaint to recent copyrights and the possibility of the loss of trade secrets. The judge also recommended that the case be heard in a state court before filing a federal court. So taking this hint from the judge, they ran out to California, refiled uh, quickly, as quickly as possible the uh, University of Cal Berkeley uh, to take any action uh, to prevent the result that if USL wanted to take any action against the university in state courts, they would be forced to do so in California rather than their home state of New Jersey. Soon after the filing of state court, USL was bought from AT&T by Novell. By 1994, a settlement had been reached in private. The exact details of the settlement were unknown until in 2004 when the California Public Records Law allowed the details to be released, where they were published on the Grok Law site. <coughs> details of the settlement included these. I think we covered these in Kirk's talk, so we won't need to iterate over those. In hindsight, this confirmed our suspicions of USL's fate. In June of 1994, two BSD distributions were released. 4.4 BSD encumbered was a version of BSD with AT&T code. It was only available to AT&T licensees. 4.4 BSD Lite was also released, which contained no AT&T code. It would become the new basis for a resync of the FreeBSD and NetBSD source code trees. As I mentioned, 4.4 BSD Lite became the new baseline from which all the BSD distributions would be based. FreeBSD, one of the first, and probably the most popular of the modern dis BSD distributions, bite my tongue, <laughs> has historically been focused on the Intel x86 platform and Linux and Windows markets. <laughs> Nevertheless, FreeBSD has been ported to other platforms, including Intel x86, Itanium, AMD64, DEC Alpha, PowerPC, and Sun UltraSpark. Some of the most popular features include application jails, access controls, excellent networking, SMP performance, and more recently ports of Solaris features like ZFS and DTrace. NetBSD, which was also originally derived from Jolis's 386 BSD, is typically known for portability to a wide range of hardware platforms. NetBSD has been ported to over 50 hardware platforms and kitchen appliances. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
open BSD. <laughs> it's yet a, no bias at all. <laughs> open BSD is yet another modern BSD derivative, originally forked from NetBSD 1.0. It's known for being highly secure with an emphasis on code correctness, proper documentation, and truly open and free source code. Their mantra is secure by default. This philosophy has influenced countless other free and proprietary operating systems which now follow their example. Here are some of the more popular platforms that OpenBSD has been ported to. And although OpenBSD has numerous security enhancements, they make efforts to integrate these changes into the base system as native, transparent technologies the philosophy has proven much more effective than bolt-on technologies such as SE Linux, where the onus is placed on the system's administrator and is quite often disabled. Yeah. <laughs> Being generous. <laughs> um, see there are some of the features in OpenBSD that we're commonly familiar with. What's PF seventeen? What? What's PF seventeen? PF what? <laughs> it's a little fucking demon. Oh, shut up. <laughs> I will take you into the frack room. Uh, they have a consistent release schedule with new releases available around the 1st of May and November. Dragonfly, another BSD, started by Matt Dillon in 2003. It's a logical continuation of FreeBSD 4.8. He started the Fr Dragonfly BSD project when his vision for threading and SMP conflicted with the other developers working on FreeBSD 5. They continue work on their SMP revamp, which I think is probably complete by now, as well as their other lightweight kernel threads implementation. More modern goals are focused on supporting gener generic clustering support natively in the kernel and features like the HammerFS. Mac OS X is an operating system sold by Apple, which runs on both PowerPC and Intel platforms. Not even remotely. All right, hecklers. Darwin is, the, uh, Darwin is the heart of OS X, a fully capable BSD Unix derivative with enhancements brought in to make OS X. Yeah. Mac, Mac <laughs> OS. All right. <laughs> no update my slides. A true consumer friendly operating system. Unfortunately, it's still somewhat of a hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> Merging the mock kernel from Next Step, along with various user land pieces from FreeBSD. Is that better? <laughs> Some other BSD distributions, including True True 64 Unix from DEC, then Compact, then HP. Oh, shit. All right. Now that we've covered some of the history behind you, behind BSD, I'd like to address the real shortcomings of modern day BSD. So why is BSD done? Is done so why is BSD done? That's where we're here to uncover. First and foremost because IDC says so. That's right. <laughs> Market share is an all-time low, under 1%. And of course, Nedcraft confirms these findings. <laughs> BSD came in last place in a sysadmin work networking test. I don't which, recall which of the BSDs were tested, but it's probably safe to assume they all finished dead last. <laughs> Market leaders and pundits have predicted that open source software can't make money. If we continue to give away free software, how will we finance our developers? Analysts are forecasting a slow spiral into bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little dated, but man, you, you just gotta love this guy. <laughs> BSD, bad. As a community, BSD has had a surprising inability to adapt. As we can see by this graph, <laughs> as we can see by this graph, the number of ASP pages served per hour. On Windows servers, far outnumbers those on, any, uh, on the Linux and all the BSDs. Um, Linux actually did generate some. We, we have to presume it's because of obfuscation, renaming their files ASP. Of course, a significant loss of talent. FreeBSD has lost 93% of their core developers. It's assumed that most of these have jumped ship to Dragonfly BSD. Unfortunately, since none of the BSDs share code, they usually have to start from scratch all over again, tracing the project's roots from 4.4 BSD Lite. 
fortunately, not as, not all is lost. There's still a, a handful of very small companies still using BSD today. I know you probably haven't heard of most of these. This, this is my employer. <laughs> Yay on ETI. And hopefully the success is seen at, yes, they, the lawyers actually told me I had to put that on there. Hopefully the success is seen in these isolated industries will bubble up into the mainstream. Looking forward, there are a number of challenges ahead ahead of us to ensure the BSD survives for generations of future geeks. The challenges aren't simply of a technological nature, but include a number of political and legal obstacles as well. First and foremost, virtualization is on everybody's radar. <laughs> Products like Xen, QEMU, VMware and Parallels allow us to optimize our hardware resources running BSD. All this means I can run over 100,000 instances of a NetBSD on a server with 4 gigs of memory. It also means I have to hire 1,000 NetBSD systems administrators to manage that one server. Not only is this a miserable return on investment, I don't think there are 1,000 NetBSD users out there. <laughs> We're looking for more advanced file systems to handle the current performance li limits associated with high capacity multi terabyte arrays. Ports of Solaris ZFS have already been completed in, port in part to FreeBSD 7 and Mac OS 10. You have blobs, NDAs, and closed documentation that all go hand in hand. These are political challenges threaten to, that threaten to limit hardware availability to BSD developers and end users. Projects like Linux and even FreeBSD have casually signed agreements and NDAs to accept non-free binary drivers into the source tree. These arrangements work against the spirit of free software and open source software, all for the purpose of short-term gains like 3D eye candy and rotating desktops. This coming from the guy who set up a game server in the next room. <laughs> Within the last year or so, legal challenges have surfaced. Linux developers have blatantly stolen BSD license code, replacing the license notification with GPL and adding their copyrights where no work was done. Beyond the legal ramifications of these actions, this demonstrates a lack of respect and cooperation for, the th for their free software peers. Diversity in the BSDs is a healthy trend. It promotes new features and competition in the intellectual market, resulting in better systems for all of us. In the end, diversity can breed unity throughout our community. And with unity, a common goal. <laughs> <laughs> the end.